I was also listening to our our great friends over at the All In Podcast. Shout out to our our besties over there. Um, they were talking about flow recently, and I think it was Chamath who mentioned he views this as just a, a REIT, a, a real estate investment trust. All right. And just like that, we are back again with another episode of the Mind the Growth podcast. As always, I am Chris Kanghorn. And I'm Eric Hoffman. Eric, today we are going with the flow and we're going to work into the watch world a little <laughs> bit. Is that kind of what's on the agenda for the day? Bad yeah, joke of the flow, day? Flow, 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 flow. Why does that sound familiar to me? It sounds like a $350 million investment to me is what I've heard. Uh, yeah. Billion dollar valuation pre-seed. Is this is this an Adam Newman story, a comeback story? See the I comeback. I think this kid? is we flow. This could be the <laughs> we flow moment that we've all been looking for. Yeah, uh, interesting choice of name, but he, it's happening. Andreessen and Horowitz sign off. <laughs> so, what's the deal? Uh, have you read it at all about this? His new adventure. Yeah, so I've I have a high level context on it for me for my opinion it sounds like he had success in the co-working space and i know a lot of people here you know adam newman and there was no success but he he really did build one of the most recognizable brands out there you know when you think of hey let's get some co-working space you're not really thinking regis you're thinking more so we work so i think his his impact that he had on the space better for worse is, is definitely recognizable. But for my take, he is getting into the residential ecosystem. Sounds like he went out and ended up buying a bunch of apartments with his own capital. The one thing to me that still is a little bit fishy, and I think where he struggled with WeWork especially, what was the what was the valuation at its peak? Was it in the $40 billion 40, dollar range? $45 billion, I think, at, at the last raise. Right. So he was, it was a real estate company, though. So it was... He was pitching it to techn uh, technology investors, but it was a real estate company. And I think where he's going to struggle with the valuation with this next go around is probably the same thing. You know, you're getting into uh, residential apartments and you're going to be providing all these different resources. We'll have to get Conrad's that's thoughts on this as well, too. If you haven't yeah. already watched our episode with Conrad, but the, the crazy valuations that you get with technology companies, they're not going to, it's not going to reflect the same valuation for a real estate company. So I think he's going to struggle a little bit on that. Hopefully, he's a little bit more humble. Hopefully, it's a little bit more of a smooth sailing ship. But yeah, what have what have you been, what have you been reading about it? So I, I've read a few things, and I have a few opinions on the whole situation. So first and foremost, your point about the valuation of WeWork at its peak, forty five billion. Obviously, it's not there, but it's still publicly traded now, and its market cap I think is between four or five billion dollars, which is a huge company nonetheless right and so well that's a huge accomplishment too yeah yeah too. yeah he built a, a great company it just was a little bit uh mismanaged at the time of him running it so i think that's why he was ousted ultimately but still just like uber or airbnb it's a category defining company it def you know nobody says i'm gonna go find a, a regis co-working space they're gonna say i i i need a we work Where's the closest we work? So it's one of those types of companies, which is just an, an incredible accomplishment in and of itself. But more importantly, he this was, I think, his actual vision for WeWork until it got started is buying properties and managing them like a tech company. And so he's realizing it seems like his original vision in this new company flow, which could become much bigger than we work, who knows. But at the time, one of the things that I was curious about, which I was reading a few people tweeting about it actually this morning, is is he personally going to own these properties and then Flow is the management company on record or is Flow going to own the properties cuz he's already bought these properties personally. And right. I don't know if he's done it under the Flow corporate name or or how he's done it because if I don't know if you recall this, but at WeWork, there was a period where he personally bought properties and then leased them to WeWork, which was part of the reason that he was ousted. And then he was taking out interest free loans. And it was just like a whole a shit show of <laughs> things going on that was a little fishy. So one person pointed out that there was a New York Times article that came out about flow. And apparently 
this is all under Flo, meaning Flo owns the properties, not him personally. So for what it's worth, at least what's reported right now, he's going the legit route, it appears today. We'll see what it turns into. But well, I think that's why he was probably able to get such a high valuation as he's already yeah. acquired, you know, these companies through Flow. It's like bootstrapping it in a yeah, sense. Exactly. So then you just add additional capital and, you know, the existing properties there. There's there's a physical, tangible asset to kind of tie into, you know, to help with that valuation. And then you can obviously figure out the additional income that you can generate, not just with rents, but the other, you know, other pieces that you can sell to the tenants and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. And I was also listening to our our great friends over at the All In podcast. Shout out to our our besties over there. Um, they were talking about flow recently, and I think it was Chamath who mentioned he views this as just a, a REIT, uh, a real estate investment right. trust. And that's how he would value it because we're, we are really dealing with hard assets and properties and, you know, however you look at it, it has to be valued like that in some way, shape or form. And so from his perspective, the billion dollar valuation could go either way. You know, it could be a high valuation. It could be a low valuation. It's it really depends on what types of properties he can ultimately acquire, what types of amenities and technology he's going to implement, et cetera. So there's a lot of unknowns. But from my perspective, it's a pretty good investment from <laughs> Andreessen Horowitz putting three hundred and fifty million dollars into one business so they don't have to go around and, you know, fund 10 businesses for 35 million. So big bet, but potential big payoff. Yeah. The, the one thing, so there's, there's people that have different theories on what type of assets to acquire. So one thing that, that I, I don't love the idea of is I struggle with buying class A. So class A is great in the sense that it's new, it's shiny. You can charge great rents, et cetera. And de but, define define that for listeners who don't know what Class A properties are. Yeah, so when you think of an apartment, so let's we'll use Optima for an example on on uh, Camelback Road in Old Town Scottsdale. So it's a high rise, it's glass, it's very modern, it's new. Your rents for a studio bedroom are going to be pushing almost three thousand dollars a month. It's it's going to be an expensive property to not only acquire, but the the rents are going to be very high. And if you can continue to push those higher, then yes, you can push your yields and you can go ahead and increase the value of the property. Um, the big piece is obviously going to be financing, where the market's at, where the cap rates are. If your caps are adjusting, you know the valuation of that property is going to move up and down. Same with interest rates. As interest rates go up, you have to pay more interest when you're paying that loan. So it's gonna it's gonna affect the you know the bottom line. So when I look at a business model of somebody who's only buying Class A properties. I think it's very ris risky in the current ecosystem. So we are in a recession. You know, what is the next 12, 18, 20 more, the 24, 36 months look like versus if you're buying properties where your average rent is, let's call it a thousand to two thousand dollars a month, those are going to be a little bit easier to keep full. You know, your quote unquote quality of person might not be as high as your class A, but how many people are really truly going to be able to afford four thousand dollars, five thousand dollars a month in rent and then paying for all these extra amenities as well too? Your buyer pool, not your buyer pool, your tenant pool is more challenging to keep full in a sense, um, unless the economy is cranking and everyone's doing well. So that's that's the one thing that kind of scares me a little bit. And I, and I don't know too much about what what Adam's trying to what he's trying to buy, kind of what their direction is. I would have to imagine it's it's new, it's flashy, it's shiny, it's it's pretty. So and that's yeah. not a bad thing. But it's it's in my head, if you want something that's a little bit more recession proof. You look for more of a class B pro property or a nice property that's in a tertiary market. Tertiary market meaning markets that aren't as affected with change and the economic climate, if you will. So, uh -huh. you know, you're not going to see prices fluctuate as much. It's going to stay a little bit more consistent. That would be that would be the biggest concern to me. But, you know, if you can buy flagship properties in Miami, Chicago, New York, L.A., there's probably enough of, de of a demand to keep those full. Yeah, I think so. Well, time will tell. And yeah, we'll uh, we'll have to have a follow up episode a year from now and see where flows at. Because I haven't watched the all in yet. I'll have to <laughs> I'll have to shout out to the to the to the what do they call themselves there? The buddies the, or the friends the, or the best, the besties, the besties. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. So one thing that I was curious about, I don't know if you read or saw he also just took on a big investment for a crypto company, Adam Newman. Did you hear about this? So I didn't 
know exactly what was going on. Uh, the first interview that he had given after the whole WeWork debacle was, what was it, like almost a year later or maybe over a year later. So I listened to that and he had talked about uh, kind of doing some uh, some investing out of his his family office and was trying to be active in the crypto space. But I haven't I haven't really read in or kept a pulse on what he's been doing. So weirdly enough, I believe it was called Flow Carbon. And so he it sounds like he's creating this whole like uh, parent company f- related around flow. But either way, it was a carbon credits play where he's basically creating a crypto token that represents carbon credits that uh, different companies can use and qualify for, et cetera, which was very interesting. I, I don't know if he's still planning on moving forward with this. He took on as far as it was reported some investment, but I'd be curious to know what he's going to be spending his day to day on <laughs> if if it's the crypto play, the real estate play, both, because that's uh, two two big shots right there that <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't have time for both, but I mean, I wonder he, if he's recruiting Al Gore to help with the yeah. uh, <laughs> with a carbon credit play. Very possibly. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah, that that was also interesting to me as a total side note. Well, good for Adam. He's back in the game. Um, yeah. See how it goes. Yeah. So what's next? What are, what else we got today? Uh, let's shift to watches because we love watches. Yeah. And the market is a. Uh, the market is for the watch market is now just like every other market. It kind of doesn't know what the hell it's doing. Yeah, yeah. And maybe some watches are becoming more affordable for for peasants like us. I don't know. Well, time will tell. No pun intended. I don't know. The ones <laughs> I'm going to show, I might have to I might have to sell my left leg, but we'll see. I know. Yeah, we'll see. So what which ones have you saw, seen le- recently and what are they doing in terms of price? OK, so I will. I know we're going to do three and three. So let me just run through my three. Let me get my screen shared <clears throat> and we're not going to start with this one. We are going to start with this one. So the first watch that we are currently, are we buffering or can you see my screen? So we are looking at the Panda Daytona. This is one of the most recognizable watches and people love it. So this watch, I think we were even talking about it. This watch a year ago was call it high 20s, low 30s, mid 30s, depending on what you're looking at. This watch worked its way up to about $50,000 and just over $50,000. And it is now back in the 30s. Um, I was also listening to a podcast with a handful of uh, watch dealers who kind of are in the gray market. And I think we touched on this in one of our previous podcasts is you've got retail and then you've got kind of this gray market. So you can't just walk into a Rolex shop shop and, and authorized dealer and really just buy a Rolex. It's really it, it just that it doesn't happen. You have to have either a previous uh, buying history or you have to have a, re- a relationship. So these uh, gray market dealers do a lot of the off market selling and really kind of the it's almost the price manipulation of what the watches are. So the Panda is now in the 30s. Um, you can find good examples, you know, mid 30s. And the the watch dealers who I was listening to, they said that they've even seen a few people sell just in, in the 29. So just under under $30,000. The next one and, is and a watch. Go ahead. I, I couldn't quite see the retail. What is it? 14 and change? Yeah, 14,550. So it used to be 13 and change. Um, I haven't been on the Rolex website for a while. So it's <laughs> actually gone up by a thousand bucks. Um, money printers going like crazy. apparently. <laughs> so inflation, shout out to inflation. <laughs> so this next watch is near and dear to my heart. This is a watch that I own. This is my first Rolex. And this is the Submariner, uh, the classic Submariner. A lot of people refer to it as the Submariner no date because it does not have the Cyclops here. It has no date on it. I like it because it's symmetrical. It's kind of how the original one was when they first released this back in the 50s, I want to say. Um, So uh, earlier this year, this watch made its way just to about $16,000. Brand new box papers. If you were to buy it from a gray out there. Uh, not, not an authorized dealer, but kind of on the secondary market. Now we're looking somewhere in between 12 to 13. If you look on Chrono 24, Bob's watches, you're going to see 13, 14, 15. But um, I've heard they're trading in between 12,000 and 13,000. So if you uh, can get it for retail, um, at call it the $9,000 number. It's still a, a good deal. And the anniversary watch. This is uh, one that I would love to have in my collection one day. One of my favorites. And this was an anniversary edition for the uh, Day Date line. 
and this watch had so much hype around it when it came out. I heard people were talking about it going for hundreds, over $100,000. But what I looked up on kind of some historic maps of it was right around the high 70s, kind of pushing 80s almost. And now this has dropped down to in the 50s. So you'll see some low 50s, some mid 50s, uh, but it's it's a beautiful watch. And um, yeah, we're, uh, we're kind of at this. It, it appears in my head that we're, we've, I think we bottomed out a little bit and the watch market starting to kind of trade parallel, kind of just trade on a straight line with maybe a little bit of an upward uh, tick, but it um, it's not spiking like it was that that run that we had for call it six months to eight months was just absolutely ridiculous. Probably probably about a year or so, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. I so I've noticed uh, a few myself that I've focused on and uh, have kind of tracked the trajectory from the lows to the highs back down to relative lows. Um, so let me just pull. OK, tell me when you can see it. Yours is a lot faster than mine. What the hell? <laughs> Shout out Cox, even though you Shout suck most of the time. Uh, OK, I've so Cox. I've got Cox fiber. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be fast. All right. So we got a, another classic, the AP Royal Oak. And so you can see here. The retail price of this is twenty five thousand three hundred for this example. They range, but this is probably a, a good one to look at because it's the most common. So going to Chrono twenty four, which is a pretty good uh, gauge of what the market's looking at right now, because the there's dealers, there's individuals selling on here. But one thing I will highlight about Chrono twenty four, just for those who are not familiar. These watches will probably trade a few percentage points less than what they're listed at because people oftentimes tend to negotiate. So right, um, right. It's, it's a good pulse, but they're yeah. usually listed on here a little bit more than what they actually trade for. Yep. A good point. It's jumping off. So you can kind of see on here, I, I'm going to say a strong example of that AP. It would probably go right now between 45 and 65, where six months ago they were at 120 which is wild i mean cutting it in half but still i mean it's <laughs> it's a 120 percent premium on the gray market which is in and of itself crazy but um i mean this is a highly sought after watch so uh it's it's a good one to track these are some of the grail watches that people talk about you got the royal oak you got the nautilus from um patek and Tech. then you got the the daytona is another example from rolex so these types of steel sport watches are usually a good idea of where the market's at because they're the most sought after so that was one i've noticed two that i've been considering purchasing lately are the rolex air king i really like this one and for 2022 uh for those of you that don't know the previous example of the air king there was a only a five here, there was no zero. And everyone was uh, giving Rolex a lot of crap because it wasn't, it was not symmetrical at this point, you know, the, the one, the one hand and the 11 hand. So they changed that they listened and they added a zero. So now there's two, two digits there, two digits there, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's more symmetrical. Did Regardless. They also add a crown guard as well. Am I, am I making this up in my head? I think so. I'm not, I, I don't know. I didn't read that, but it's possible. I, gotcha. I don't think okay. so though. It's just their, you know, basic flat bezel, um, on this one. So this one retails at 7,400 and at, you know, six months ago, these were going for like 15 to 17 on the gray market. Now you'll get a new example, like unworn for about 10. So still a slight premium, but the second one that this is probably going to be my next watch is the Rolex Explorer 2. This one retails at 9,500. And right now, again, it comes in both a black and white face. I like the white face and you can get one anywhere from 11 to 15. So also, you know, a premium, but this, I, I saw some of these going for 20, uh, six months ago. So everything's coming down. I'm not sure if there's more room for it to come down. I have a feeling that in the next 
few months, we're going to see more turmoil in the market. Partly the reason why is because with the Ukraine war still going on, sanctions in Russia, gas is unpredictable, oil is you know fluctuating daily. And a lot of people are concerned about Europe in particular having a rough winter where they can't actually heat homes because they don't have enough gas or power or electricity. So that's going to be interesting. If that actually comes true, there's going to be a lot more bumps in the road, I would say, in the market. And people are going to buckle down even further from what they're doing now. Right now, I think last week we saw a bit of a summer relief rally, which uh, what was it Monday? There was like a 600 point slide in the Dow. And so confidence isn't super high right now. We still may have room to, to drop further. Hard to tell, but I'm well, the kinda... Fed's also talking about not necessarily slowing the, uh, the rate hikes as well, too. So yeah. I think a lot of people were thinking that this, the, this last go around of the second 75 basis point increase could have been the last at 75. So you know, if, if it kind of leaks out that they're going to do another 75 and not start, start pulling back to 50 or 25 basis points, then it's the market's going to have to price it in. We're going to see the correction. Yeah, I think so. So correction. I, I think we're going to see a little bit of that. We'll see. I mean, it would be nice if things just started going up and up and up again, but I don't think that's a reality. <laughs> so uh, I'm buckling down. I'm holding off on big purchases like this. But I don't know, maybe maybe I'll itch hard enough and one of them will pop up on an episode in the near future. We'll see. Like, <laughs> pull, pull, pull up your screen real quick because I do want to I do want to show you something on that Air King. Yeah. So, yeah. OK, so uh, you see where the crown is on the right hand side next to the oh, three. Yeah. So oh, for, the crown for those guard. who are listening. Yeah. So that crown guard is new. Is that too, that so wasn't for, there before. Now it was flat. And I just I sent you on Slack uh, an image of the 20, 2010 model. Um, Gotcha. I think this one. Yep, you're right. No crown guard. Yeah, so I like that. I if unfortunately, event, every is. once in a while you smack the shit out of your watch. So if you've got the <laughs> crown guard in there, it's kind of yeah. helpful. And I think it makes it look more like a Submariner, which I'm a Rolex fanboy. So that makes me like it even more. I agree. So just for clarity, for for all you listeners, this is the old one. It does not have the zero here. And it does not have the crown guards. The new one does. Let's see if it's a bigger photo. Okay, perfect. So we got the zero added. We got the crown guard, and it's it's a beautiful watch. So the cho like the choice is really: Do I like green more than I like orange? <laughs> and if you like green, you might as well just get the the Kermit Submariner at that know, point. The Starbucks. I, I love that one. That's hopefully so my next. My next. We'll see. So many options, so little money. <laughs> Come on, Bitcoin. Come on, Ethereum. Cardano, where you at? We need, we need to pop. Yeah. The ADA gang is has been murdered, unfortunately. ADA gang is <laughs> me included. It's been a, it's been a sad, it's been a sad eight months. But yeah, <laughs> we're gonna DCA and we'll be all right. Yeah, fingers crossed. All right, anything else for today? That's it. Signing off. If you have it. Like, comment, subscribe. Oh, one thing else we want to point out in our social media. we um, The one thing we do at the end of every single one of these episodes, I say the same phrase every time, what, uh, what does the word growth mean to you? So what we did is we took a handful of some of those responses and we put them in our, our Instagram. So feel free to check it out. They're all just continued. There's I think there's three or four posts. It's on Twitter as well too. Uh, check it out. And until next time, guys. Yeah, and if you feel so inclined comment on those posts and tell us what the word growth means to you. And we'll highlight and like some of those comments as well. And maybe you'll be featured on the show at some point. So do your thing. We love you. Adios. <laughs> See you guys. Bye.